think we are ready to get started with the business of the day. Um, so my name is Zikonan Gerbe, and I am the Research and Advocacy Officer at Judges Matter, and I will be chairing this webinar. So before I introduce myself, I would like to advise everyone that this webinar is being recorded, and we trust that no one has an objection to the recording of the webinar. If not, then we can get started. I'll start with introducing the team. So we've got uh, our, our director, Ms. Svania Karth. She's the director of DGRU, Democratic Governance and Rights Unit. We have Ms. Alison Tilly, who is the coordinator at Judges Matter. We have Mr. Chris Oxtabi, who is the senior researcher of DGRU. We also have Mr. Matthias Cronier, who is, this, who is the researcher at DGRU as well. And we have Mr. Mbegeze Benjamin, who is a research and advocacy officer of Judges Matter. And today we are also kindly joined by two special guests, the Deputy Minister of Justice and Constitutional Development. And we have the Regional Court President, Ms. Yaki Vessels. She is the Regional Court President of Limpopo. Okay. Um, so, Previously, we launched a report, um, which was the 2019 survey of South African magistrates' perception of their working environment. And today we are launching the report on an analysis of misconduct proceedings against magistrates in South Africa. This is what we call the conduct report, and it is titled The Call Face of Justice. And we are also very, very excited to be launching our website, Magistrates Matter, Along with the reports that I've mentioned just now, we are also launching our combined recommendations going forward. And these are based on the two reports that I've mentioned. So these recommendations um, are six in total. The first recommendation is that the legal framework and rules for lodging complaints of misconduct needs to be regular, regularized. A second, secondly, the use of retired judicial officers as presiding officers in conduct proceedings should be considered. Third, we say that candidates to be appointed as magistrates should be required to possess a recognized law degree and to undertake an examination and or prescribed training prior to taking up appointment. Fourth, we say that semi-formal facilitated opportunities for dialogue and discussion among magistrates should be mandatory. Fifth, we say that more formal professional psychosocial support services should be made available. And lastly, we say that uh, public education or engagement should be undertaken on the role of the magistrates commission and the complaints process. Um, we are aware that these recommendations might be a lot to, to take in. So we have created a beautiful video, which clearly outlines these recommendations and informs us of issues for further research and engagement. So we've got Ms. Bendegezeli Benjamin, who will be playing the video for us.
you. Thank you very much, Mbege Zedi, for that beautiful video. Um, without further ado, let us give the floor to the Deputy Minister of Justice and Constitutional Development, Mr. John Jeffries, who will talk about the way forward for judicial reform in the magistracy. Good morning, everybody. Um, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to, uh, to speak at this, this launch. If one believes that justice matters, then it's imperative to acknowledge that magistrates matter and they matter in a very big way. In his first court statement in the 1962 trial, the late President Mandela said, and I quote, in its proper meaning, equality before the law means the right to participate in the making of laws by which one is governed, the constitution which guarantees democratic rights to all sections of the population, the right to approach the court for protection or relief in the case of a violation of rights guaranteed in the constitution, and the right to take part in the administration of justice as judges, magistrates, attorney generals, that would now be directors of public prosecutions, law advisors, and similar positions. It's this last sentence that's really applicable and pertinent to all of us, the right to take part in the administration of justice as judges, magistrates, attorney general, attorneys general, law advisors, and similar positions. At the time when he said these words, the majority of the people of this country, along with most white women as well, had zero chance of participating in the administration of justice. We've come a long way. and We can, can, we can and must take pride in the gains we've made since then. Today, our judicial officers reflect our society. We've still got uh, some way to go in terms of gender, but it's a lot, a lot of progress has been made. Our magistrates' courts continue to be the first port of call for access to justice for most people, with 740 courthouses countrywide. For a court to render a service, it must be supported by judicial officers who are committed to serve the public and the cause of justice, in particular the needs of the poor and the most vulnerable. Often, our magistrates are the very face of the law. Our magistrates' courts are at the forefront of people's interaction with the law and the justice system. A justice system which speaks to the needs of our people, and more importantly, a justice system which enjoys the broad confidence of all South Africans. In October 1993, less than a year before the dawn of our democracy, Nelson Mandela told the Law Society of the Transvaal, as it was then known, why our judges and magistrates are so important. And he said, the vast majority of the people of South Africa cannot be asked to wait indefinitely for fundamental changes in the judiciary, which is not perceived to be sensitive to the needs and aspirations of all the people of South Africa, and which does not enjoy the broad confidence of all South Africans. So the question is, how do we ensure that our judicial officers enjoy the broad confidence of the public? How do we hold the judiciary accountable, but without infringing on its independence? How do we support our courts without interfering in them? And this is where bodies such as Magistrates Matter and the DRGU are fundamental. The public expect the highest standards of conduct from our judicial officers in our courts. As Chief Justice Mohueng Mohueng correctly said, and I quote, lack of public confidence in the judiciary has the potential of eroding the moral authority of the judiciary. It's in the magistrates courts that the vast majority of South Africans access justice. And that's why the public, public's perceptions of the magistracy ultimately affects their confidence in the justice system as a whole. No doubt all of us remember the media articles earlier this year when reported on, uh, which reported on interviews with 88 applicants for vacancies in the regional magistrates positions and purported an alleged lack of knowledge among some of the applicants of the laws around rape. Judges Matter sat in on the interviews and this allowed for a debate and discussion amongst the public and other stakeholders on the competency of candidates for judicial office. And um, maybe just as an aside, one of the, the recommendations you make is for um, judges to have, a, I mean, magistrates to have a law degree and a competency test. Um, I, there were also expectations that I would speak uh, on a single judiciary, and this is where these two issues are linked. I think there was a provision that magistrates must have a law degree uh, that got taken out to bring it in line with the judges who I think just have to be fit and proper people. And if there were going to be competency tests for magistrates, uh, then what about competency tests for, for judges? 
so it is linked into uh, a single judiciary and treating people similarly. Um, in supporting our courts and judicial officers, we need to continuously strengthen recruitment and selection processes. And one way of doing this is by making these processes more transparent. Adv advocacy groups, academic institutions, civil society and the media all play a vital role in this regard. The Magistrates Commission consists of a number of important stakeholders and plays an important role in the filling of vacancies of magistrates posts. The Commission's Appointments Committee ask rigorous questions as they should. Regional court magistrates are required to deal with serious matters and as such, such interviews are very stringent so that only the best candidates are considered for appointment. Applicants are tested on their knowledge of the law as well as their functional legal experience either as practitioners of the law, academics or as presiding officers. The involvement of judges matter and now magistrates matter and the democratic governance rights units makes the recruitment process even more transparent. Having magistrates matters sit on the interview processes allows for greater access and insight in the recruitment of magistrates as they then report on what transpired to the public. And having a website along with the research reports by the DRGU will further contribute to making the, these processes even more transparent and enhancing accountability even more. Greater transparency also means closer scrutiny of candidates who avail themselves for appointment as judicial officers. Those who avail themselves uh, and appear ill-prepared carry the risk of harm to the magistracy and the courts and therefore the involvement of civil society, advocacy groups or academic institutions such as the DRGU and Magistrates Matter should be seen as part of our attempts to strengthen our magistracy. Where candidates fall short, they are not recommended for appointment. The public can therefore rest assured that where there are displays of ineptitude or lack of ability, appoints, appointments are not made. Then there's also the issue of complaints, discipline and the competency of our magistrates. In a very old English case, uh, the King versus Sainsbury, it goes back to 1791, the court held, and I quote, it is of infinite importance to the public that the acts of magistrates should not only be substantially good, but they should also be substantially, so they should also be decorous. Here too, both Magistrates Matter and the DRGU have a vital role to play in creating a better understanding around issues of discipline and the roles played by the Magistrates Commission and Parliament in this regard. Maybe just a few points on, on the topic that uh, you intended me to speak about, which was the single judiciary. Uh, to some extent, we have one already in, in that uh, the Chief Justice is the head of the judiciary and that includes uh, the magistrates. In the Superior Courts Act, the judge president of a province is um, also responsible uh, for the, the magistrates. Um, we have, however, a different uh, system um, for magistrates, and that is the Magistrates Commission as opposed to the Judicial Services Commission. There had been debate in the past around shouldn't the Magistrates Commission be a subcommittee of the JSC, um, but I think the problems with that is that given the volumes, the numbers of magistrates, um, uh, that is where a lot of work is, is required. So I think it's something we can still debate. Uh, legislation um, or new um, lower, a, a new lower courts uh, bill and a new magistrates bill uh, will be introduced or are being worked on and will be introduced shortly um, to, to update that legislation. But I think we need to debate around what do we mean by a single judiciary. But in closing, I want to congratulate both Magistrates Matter and the DRGU on all their hard work thus far. And I know that the website will be a great success. The work you're doing deepens democracy and in a true and meaningful way. And I can assure you of our department's support for all your endeavors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Minister, uh, for a very insightful address, especially highlighting the importance of magistrates in South Africa is that they, the, they are indeed the first port of call um, thank you so much for that. Um, now let's give the floor to the regional court president of Limpopo, Ms. Yaki Vessels, who will talk about access to justice in South Africa as an ongoing challenge, 
uh, specifically what the biggest challenges are faced uh, in, within the magistracy and what could we as civil society uh, and the profession do to support better access to justice. Thank you very much. And firstly, I just want to add my voice to that of the Deputy Minister in thanking the RGU and Magistrates Matter for the initiatives that they have taken. And in particular, also regarding the research, because this is extremely important um, that these proper research are being done. And looking at the recommendations that was mentioned, how many of these things are things that we had been talking about and asking for for a long time. And hopefully with this research report and their recommendations, we will get a little bit closer and actually achieving some of these goals and that it will be taken seriously with them behind these recommendations as well. With regards to access to justice, it cannot be overemphasized how important that is. It is a basic right and an essential principle of rule of law that there must be access to justice. But even more than that, um, if you look at the right to equality, it provides specifically that everybody has got the right to equal protection and benefit of the law as well. And without access to justice, the right to equality essentially is being violated as well. We have a lot of challenges in the lower courts. And it ranged from a variety of different things, from the basic frustrations we all have with regard to aspects such as load shedding and water problems. Um, now with COVID, the courts had struggled to be able to function properly. And there had been challenges for courts to be COVID compliant. A lot of the functionality problems are relating, unfortunately, to the manner in which the service level agreements are with regard to fixing of basic equipment, because without the recording machine, it's extremely difficult to be able to proceed with any matter. A lot of it, unfortunately, is also the human element. People can't help, I suppose, sometimes to be ill. However, you often would find the people not being at court with no reasons being provided for that. And it really is necessary that stronger action be taken against people that do not honor their commitments to come to court. And I'm talking here more particularly in regards to the practitioners and prosecutors that appears in our courts and who are driving the cases without whom a case cannot proceed. Obviously court personnel as well. And we often unfortunately have a lot of problems with regard to criminal matters in the manner in which it's being investigated and evidence gathered, witnesses being informed and subpoenaed. Um, it is tragic. Witnesses often have no idea what is going on with their cases. And that essentially is also undermining their ability to know whether or not they will get justice in their matters. There is unfortunately also at courts a challenge with regard to the training of personnel and the lack of resources. The basic resources that we take for granted, without that, it does make the administration of justice extremely problematic. Um, for example, also in regards to proper data collection, if matters are not properly captured, then it is very difficult to be able to have the correct information. And a case outcomes, for example, is not being updated. Um, there's also been 
for years a, a request from us that we need to start utilizing technology more and need to develop proper online systems. Why should a person have to take a day of work often without pay in order to come stand in a line at the courts in order to get a form to apply for a protection order or for maintenance when they would have been able to do that online if that was available. And we really need to start being more proactive in that regard as well. Because in the end of the day, access to justice is not just about having a court building somewhere. It is also about being able to access it. Talking about court buildings, that of course is another big problem because we do have big towns without courts. And ensuring that people are able to access courts closer is extremely important. With the pandemic, there had been some positive developments. For example, for many years, we've been utilizing Section 158, utilizing the CCTV systems in our courts for testimony of traumatized witnesses. And due to the pandemic, something that we had been asking for prior to the pandemic already, that we be able to utilize Section 158 for a remote testimony of witnesses to enable us to move faster with cases. For example, it's so much easier if, for example, an expert witness can utilize remote audiovisual links to testify than having to try and get them to courts, especially where there's not a lot of them around and they are booked. And it would also be quite a cost saving feature. And that has been utilized a lot more. And I must say, in particular with civil matters, we had found that utilizing virtual hearings had really assisted with being able to finalize matters. And as you might know, the Judicial Matters Amendment Bill does make provision that the use of the audiovisual link as well as intermediaries be extended to all proceedings, which will definitely bring a positive change as far as we are concerned to enable justice to move a little bit better, hopefully, um, because we do need to make sure that service delivery at courts improve. And the frustration of witnesses in cases and parties and matters that seem to be dragging on forever is very real and it needs to be addressed. However, the only way that we can really address it is that everybody must start taking their commitment to justice serious. And that goes for the court staff and the practitioners, the prosecutors, and of course the judicial officers as well. Um, in this regard, civil society can also play an important role. And in some areas, there is a lot of support services available from civil society that does assist litigants and witnesses to a great extent. Unfortunately, it is not available everywhere. And in particular, as more rural provinces often um, are a bit of a step, stepchild in this regard. And it is extremely important that we really need to reach out and work together yeah, in Limpopo, we had in the beginning of September started with 200 day actions, trying to address some of the backlogs as a result of everything that had been happening this year so far. And in particular with our divorce backlog project, it was so gratifying to see how not only all the various stakeholders, the practitioners, the family advocate, uh, legal aid, the assistant registrars and everybody started um, coming together in trying to address it. But in particular, even a civil society organization, and particularly here, it was the ADR network, but also other mediators that joined up with them for purposes of the project 
to, for example, provide free mediations for matters that is older than nine months in order to help the parties to move towards finalization of the matter, which I think is an excellent example of a good working relationship between all of us in order to make sure that justice is being served. Um, our other project, 100 Day Project, in, in relation to gender-based violence and femicide matters on the criminal roles, uh, where we're also trying to fast track some of the finalization of these cases. The important role that civil society can play in this regard, not just with regard to monitoring, but also with these kind of proactive actions, such as demonstrated here with the research reports, is definitely something that can only assist us to strengthen the whole administration of justice in the end of the day. And it is really welcome that we now have also a website that put the spotlight and the focus on the magistracy, not just the bad, but also in order to support the magistracy and through that, hopefully, to also assist with improving our efforts to ensure that there is access to justice for everybody and that people will actually receive the necessary protection and benefit of the law as they are entitled to. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak at this launch. And it was really uh, something to be applauded, ERG and Magistrates Matter. Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, for that wonderful address, especially the proposition of having online services to ensure better access to justice. Um, now we're going to move on to the Q&A session. I see that there are various comments on the chat box and that will be uh, handled by Mr. Megazidi Benjamin. I will hand it over now to you, Megazidi. Thanks, Sikona, and thank you very much to both of our, of our panelists this morning. Um, we appreciate your, your words, uh, Deputy Minister and uh, Magistrate Vessels. We, we really do appreciate the time you've taken um, to, to put down these thoughts. Um, I, I just want to highlight quickly some of the things that have, that have come out from, from both um, speakers. And I, I think both of them really put at the center um, the important role of, of magistrates um, in, in giving uh, ordinary South Africans access to justice. Um, the role of the magistrates court um, in, in ensuring that uh, people's experience of, of, of the justice system um, is, is one that provides justice at, the, at, the, at, at first and then it, it gives them dignity. Um, um, some of the common issues that I, that I, I take from, from both um, our talks um, is, is the issue um, that we've also highlighted in, in the recommendations that we've put forward. Um, issues, for example, of uh, 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 training and supporting magistrates um, uh, to ensure that they execute their, their duties as much as they can, um, increasing transparency uh, within the magistracy and the processes um, within the magistracy, including uh, in appointments and in conduct. Um, magistrates, uh, or, or they also, both speakers also spoke about law reform. There are different um, uh, pieces of legislation that are currently under discussion, um, including the big concept of um, the single judiciary, um, which is uh, meant to really reform the way that our court systems work. Um, there was also a mention of infrastructure um, and technology and the use of technology in increasing um, access to justice. And I think both speakers also emphasize the role of, of civil society, including ourselves and, and, and other um, members of civil society in, in supporting the magistracy um, to ensure access to justice. 
Now, with that said, I want to quickly move on to some of the comments that um, have, have come through. Um, and I'll, I'll later touch on the questions. Um, so uh, I think it's Judge Mutsumi um, spoke um, about the, the debates and exchanges uh, around um, the single the concept of, of this uh, uh, single judiciary and the and the independence of the uh, magistrate three and uh, she she wished uh, Deputy Minister Jeffries in particular but I'm sure all stakeholders uh, succeeds in, in in achieving this goal. Um, uh, Mr. Yanki from the Justice Committee um, spoke about uh, the issue of the single judiciary again and his views that. Um, the, the implementation of the single judiciary should um, overhaul what exists uh, in the Judicial Service Commission uh, and the Magistrates Commission. And he highlighted the, the point that you can't really merge these two things um, uh, under a dysfunctional uh, system. So we, we must overhaul what, what doesn't work. And then there were two questions so far. Um, one was asked by Musa, uh, Ms. Musa Kwebani, and uh, Musa, the way I understand your question is really on, on, on access to magistrates court uh, uh, judgments um, and uh, the transparency around that. You, you mentioned um, that they are not uh, currently reported or, or, or published in, 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 in any form publicly. And um, how can we, uh, how can that be addressed? Um, I, I will hand it over to maybe, um, Message at Vessels or uh, Deputy Minister Jeffrey, uh, but a short comment uh, coming from the, the DGRU. Um, we have a, a project called um, African Lee, um, which, uh, which is uh, African uh, Legal Information Institute. Um, and it, it also includes another project called Laws.Africa, where we're using um, a technology to try and um, provide access for, to legal information. Um, including uh, court judgments from all over um, the African continent. And uh, this is, uh, the team has been discussing about how do we uh, provide access to written court judgments from the magistrates courts, but it's, it's a conversation that's ongoing and I would, I would welcome um, a view from Deputy Minister Just uh, Jeffrey and um, um, Magistrate Vessels. And uh, let me quickly get to the second question before I hand over to, to both our speakers. Um, the second question is to both panelists and it comes from um, Jean Bodenstein um, from Rape Crisis. Um, Jean asks um, whether um, magistrates have sufficiently, um, or sufficiently understand and have internalized that they are the very embodiment of access to justice for most South Africans. And she asked, uh, if they, they do not underst understand this and internalize this, how can we change it? So uh, with that, um, I'll welcome more questions uh, from, uh, from the attendees, but so far I'd like to hand over to you, uh, Deputy Minister Jeffrey and Magistrate Vessels. You, you can follow after. Look, I, I think, um... Uh, on the issue of reported reporting of judgments, I mean, the, the one issue obviously is that uh, magistrates court judgments, that's district and regional, don't set precedents. So the fact that one magistrate has ruled in a particular way um, does not really have any impact on, on other magistrates um, uh, apart from information. Uh, so I think that's the sort of main reason why there's such a difference. Um, obviously, reporting would, would increase costs. I mean, the records are transcribed, um, uh, but it would increase costs. I think we are very dependent on the media to cover what's happening in the courts, and it makes it more difficult when it comes to, uh, to the more rural courts where there's less media around. Um, I mean, it, 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 there's also a question that was asked to me, uh, Becca Zelli, that you didn't read out from uh, Jamie Joseph um, on the disciplinary issues or a specific one. But um, one of the disciplinary ones, not the, not the one that Ms. Joseph refers to, related to a regional court magistrate uh, in KZN who had given 
um, shockingly inappropriate sentences in sexual offences matters. And it took some time for it to go on, on review. And obviously um, now, well, the, she's been suspended and uh, the reviews are ongoing. But yeah, I mean, my question is always sort of, but why wasn't it picked up? Um, still wanting feedback from the NPA about why they didn't do anything. Uh, but that's part of the, the, the problem with the lack of information or lack of reporting when things go wrong um, it's, it's more difficult um, for it to be taken up. Um, if I can just respond, Bekazeli, can I respond to the uh, Jamie Joseph question? It's on the question and answer uh, session, yes. not uh, section, not on the comment line. Yes, please, yes, please, Deputy Minister. All right, well, she asks, um, I mean, she runs a, a charity, Saving the Wild, and she's been very involved in um, what she terms exposing the black, the blood rhino blacklist, um, an alleged syndicate of corrupt magistrates in KZN who not only take bribes on rhino poaching and rape cases, but they also pay for their appointments by putting their money into suspended re uh, uh, court president, regional court president Eric Nzimande's bank account. Five years on and no one has been criminally charged or fired. Will there ever be justice? Um, <sighs> The sort of bind, look, let me just say, I'm, I get extremely frustrated with the length of time these things are taking. Um, uh, particularly the Magistrates Commission takes its time uh, on the regional court magistrate um, that I referred to earlier. It took, um, it took over a year from the, from the first uh, reviews of her judgment in the High Court coming out for her to be uh, suspended. In the case of the Regional Court President, uh, I think it took two years, or it could have even been longer, and this was after it was, was, was publicized. The difficulty we are faced with is that, um, and it's the question of judicial independence, and I think it would apply to, uh, to judges as, as, well, I think it, it does apply to judges as well, that um, the minister can't just suspend a magistrate or a judge for that matter. It's reliant on a, a process from the magistrates commission. We've got to be quite careful of um, being seen to be involved in public pressure or responding to public pressure. I, I think Mr. Nzimande has already raised those points in, in uh, some of his defense somewhere, but I speak under, under correction. And then also with the police investigations, um, uh, the issue of political interference will similarly get raised uh, in, in any matter, um, but would, would I'm sure also get raised in a magistrate's matter. So, uh, I mean, you, you, you did as, as magistrate's matter or DRG, you do this, this um, uh, report on magistrates disciplinary proceedings, but I think it's a fundamental area. It needs to move uh, faster. The allegations against Mr. Nzimande were front page of the KZN witness. Uh, and um, as I said, it took two years for, for uh, him to be, or the commission to recommend his suspension, which was what was ne necessary to happen. And, you know, my concern was, well, and it would be probably the same as Ms. Joseph's, what do the public think? They read about this thing in the, the front page of the media, these allegations, and the person is, is, is still there. And um, his disciplinary matter is, is well, it, I think everything got de delayed by COVID. Uh, he, in fact, is, is uh, raising concerns about it taking so long. Uh, but, you know, it, it, it's still far from, from uh, being finalized. It hasn't even properly, the hearing hasn't properly started yet. So I, I do, but I do think that, that the, the question of without I mean, you don't want a situation where a, um, a senior government person, a minister, whatever, dislikes a decision of a magistrate or a judge and then suspends them. And you can always, I think, find issues to, to make complaints about or to, to levy complaints about. So you've got to protect the judiciary from that. But at the same time, it becomes then more difficult when you it would seem without prejudging either matter, but it would seem that there's a problem about how long it takes. So it's, it's a bind really. 
Thanks. Uh, uh, thanks, Deputy Minister. Um, there are uh, there is one uh, follow up uh, question from Ms. Joseph, but I will will hand over to Ms. Uh, uh, to Magistrate Vessels for now, and then um, we will will come back if there's if there's some time. Thank you, Ms. Magistrate Vessels. You can go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, with regard to the access to our judgments, um, as was indicated by the Deputy Minister, there is the issue of the fact that. Um, most of the time it would be needed to be transcribed. That is costing money. Um, we, within the Regional Court President's Forum, we have been looking at whether or not there are some ways where some of our judgment, uh, because we, a lot of our judgments we actually do write. So it's available and we circulate it between ourselves, but putting it out there uh, for the public, um, whether or not there is a viable way to do that, Part of the problem is, is just um, the administration involved in, in trying to do anything like that. Uh, we just don't have the capacity for doing something like that. Um, but it is maybe something that one can um, or should consider or talk about a bit more, um, even though it's not precedent setting, as the deputy minister had indicated, um, that they are, if there's an interest that it be out there for various reasons and also uh, from an access to justice point of view, because unfortunately the reality is, is that with the victims, for example, often would not be at court at the day that the judgment is actually given or the sentence is given, and they would not have heard the motivation for the decision by the judicial officers. Um, the audio recordings is available, um, though again, it's not available publicly. So maybe that would be something that one can have a look at as well, uh, because then there would not be a transcription cost involved. With regard to John's question um, about understanding the embodiment of that magistrates, whether or not they understand that they are the embodiment of access to justice, and if not, how we can change it. Um, look, in particular with the regional court uh, training, that is something we do take very serious. And um, as you would know that for newly appointed regional magistrates, um, there had been intensive training previously. And uh, we actually got some flack because of the fact that the training is apparently too intensive. Uh, but it is something that we do take very seriously to make sure that people really do understand it. And, and also on a continuous basis to remind ourselves of, of this. Um, as how far everybody really appreciate that fact, um, I hope that most would do. If I look at most of my colleagues, they're very much aware of that. But it is something that needs to be discussed on a regular basis. You know, it's the same as the oath that we took. We need to remind ourselves on a regular basis of what is the oath that we took to ensure and remind ourselves that we actually comply with that oath. And um, I also noted, um, John, the question in the chat about whether or not practitioners, for example, in smaller and rural places out of fear of retaliation or intimidation might be the reason that they do not lodge complaints. Um, it may be. It may also be that a lot of people are actually not sure about how to lodge complaints. I had occasion at, at complaints that was in regards to a regional magistrate that was sent to the chief magistrate's office that eventually got to me and I eventually then forward it to the Magistrates Commission. So it's quite clear that people do not always, and that include practitioners, do not always know what the procedure is. And that is why the recommendation in this regard from the research report is really important. And maybe it's also something that, um, you know, if you Google it, it's, it's, there's not a clear website or anything where people can easily see, you know, complaints, do it here or, you know, how to do it. So maybe that is also something again that needs to be looked at and that definitely can improve. Um, so that it is easier for people and that you do know how to go about doing it. 
Um, I think that covered more or less the issues that was for me. Thank yes. you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Magistrate Vessels. You have you have covered the issues. Um, uh, 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 the attendees will notice that um, the uh, panelists refer to uh, a research report um, uh, that speaks to some of the issues. And the research report um, was done by the DGRU, and it, it focused on the on the system to hold. Um, magistrates accountable for misconduct. Um, that is a, 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 a process that is run by the um, uh, magistrates commission. And so what the uh, DGRU research team did was to um, look at, at, the, at the information available at the magistrates commission on, on uh, complaints and try to analyze uh, what these complaints mean. I'll, I'll try to pull up um, a copy of the, the front cover uh, of the uh, of the research report, and it's called uh, the Cold Face of Justice, and it's it's it is available on the um, Magistrates Matter website that we are also launching today, and it it touches on a lot of the issues um, that uh, are raised today that are raised particularly by uh, Ms. Joseph and and others, um, but it also um, is the source of the recommendations that we're putting forward. So, for example, on the transparency. Um, and 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 of the of the conduct system and educating the public on whether or not they can lodge complaints. That is one of the uh, weaknesses that we saw in the system. Um, that not many people know that you can lodge a complaint against the magistrates for misconduct. Um, and um, who do you lodge the complaint to, and, and how do you go about doing that? So we've we've tried to address those, um, and it is available on the magistrates matter uh, website. So um, I see there are one or two more questions and, and comments. Um, I will quickly try to read them. Um, there's a few comments from um, Ms. Joseph that speak uh, on, on this issue of, of magistrates taking uh, bribes and in particular, I think this is a KZN related case. Um, and it also um, includes uh, the NPA and, and others. Uh, I think this is this is one one of the um, weaknesses. I think that um, Deputy Minister, you've also identified uh, that it, it's not clear about how long these processes take, and and it's quite frustrating. Um, but with that said, if there aren't any more questions, um, I would like to. Uh, quickly hand over to to Alison, who will speak more about uh, the new website, uh, Magistrates Matter. Alison, over to you. Thanks very much, Mbex. Um, we've uh, we was we were sort of urged, um, I think, to to start Magistrates Matter um, by by people who started to ask about what we were doing about magistrates and, and and of course the answer is yes magistrates do matter um, but we didn't want to just uh, start talking off the cuff about what we think the issues are so we've spent a while really looking at the at the background um, looking at the legislation looking at the practice and I think there are a number of policy issues which which do emerge uh, we've tried to put the research and the recommendations and some discussion about how the magistracy works up onto this new website, which is Magistrates Matter. Um, we also are starting some uh, social uh, media accounts. So there'll be a Magistrates Matter Facebook uh, group and a Twitter handle. And as we proceed um, and we develop more information, more op-eds, um, we'll be making those public on the website. Um, as you may know, the, the Magistrates Commission will be interviewing uh, for some magistrates appointments uh, in, in the next couple of weeks. And that's something that we're trying to get a handle on how to attend because there, there are going to be a lot of interviews. We're not sure that we can attend all of them, um, but that's certainly one of the next steps that will be taking and that content uh, will then be loading up onto the uh, the Magistrates Matter website. So we hope the website will become um, perhaps as to the to some extent Judges Matter uh, has become as a place where we can 
you know, not only curate the information that we develop, but also what other people think um, uh, about the issues that we raise. Um, our uh, Casey uh, from Edge uh, Digital, who are our um, awesome social media agency, are she's put up in the the chat the uh, Twitter handle as well as the Facebook page, so you can just click on those, um, and and it'll take you through to through to those pages. Uh, I think that's uh, that wraps it up. Unless anybody from the team feels that I've forgotten something, um, I would then just like to thank everybody very much. Um, thank you for attending. And oh, the first batch of interviews start from the second of uh, November. So that's Monday. Yeah. <laughs> uh, listen, actually, you, um, we, we have tried to be in contact with the Magistrates Commission on, on, on uh, attending the interviews and we will, we will try to attend some um, but of course we won't be, uh, I don't, we, currently our capacity doesn't allow to, uh, us to attend all of them. Um, and, but we will we'll try to attend some of them and, and post them up on the website and the social media pages. There was a, a question about Instagram, um, whether we will post on Instagram. Um, not for now, um, because I think that the team is a bit photo shy and um, images that we have are a bit limited, but let's get more photos in and then and then we will post something on, on Instagram. But for now, um, Twitter and Facebook are our main pages. The Twitter handle is, is match, match, so M-A-G underscore matter, M-A-T-T-E-R. Um, you can follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. The link is on the on the Twitter on the uh, chat section of of, of this uh, forum. So, um, Alison, oh, uh, Zikon, I think uh, we can hand back over to you. Thank you so much, Alison and Mbex. Um, I think we have come to the end of today's business, seeing that there are no further questions or comments. Um, I think they are this, oh, it's just a thank you comment. Um, thank you so much for to everyone who has attended. Thank you to the to our guests, the Deputy Minister and uh, the Regional Court President of Limpopo for your wonderful address. And it was very informative. And thank you to everyone who has commented and, and asked questions. As Mbegezeli and Alison have said, we are now live, Magistrates Matter is live, and we will be um, putting in the work to bring transparency within the magistracy. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.